So we are going to go bananas and build an AI model with Shiny, which is a really catchy title. I picked it for a reason. One, because it's a bit catchy. And uh, as you will see over the board, but it has something to do with bananas, which is the part that is going to be true for our data set. So I already introduced myself, I'm a data scientist. And sometimes, especially when COVID hit, uh, we were just sitting at home and no one was really brave enough to venture outside, although that was like the smallest peak as it turned out later, but we didn't know that at the time. So the only place we went all maxed up was uh, just uh, to the store to buy some bananas because I had this idea, oh, maybe I can uh, make a data set out of them. And then I was thinking, oh, this could be like almost as good as a data set as maybe Palmer penguins at some point. So we'll see. <laughs> but uh, then I used this data set to develop a, a workshop uh, like a half a year ago. And uh, it turned out to be a good choice for, for Shiny or just kind of walking through the steps. And so that's what I'm going to tell you a bit more about. So first, talk about Shiny. What is Shiny? If you look up the package description, the web application framework for R, which makes it incredibly easy to build interactive web applications. It has automatic reactive binding, which means different parts of the application or your code know each other. So when one is changing, then it lets the other things know, hey, uh, this input has changed, so change the output. So it's a, a network of connected things, which uh, makes it really interactive. And uh, you can build all kinds of cool widgets like uh, for map visualization or interactive graphics that you can easily uh, go from R code to a really uh, nice visualization. And it's also responsive. And I, I underlined a couple of these words because Interactive means that when you hover, for example, above a plot, it gives you the value. So it's not just a boring bar plot anymore, but it gives you exactly that it's 65.8. Or maybe it also well, changes colors. Reactive means this network that I talked about. And uh, responsive means that if you resize, then things reorganize so you can have a look at uh, the application on your phone and it is not going to be incredibly uh, useless in that regard. So these three terms are very similar, but also have some distinct meaning. And that's why I wanted to explain that up front. So it's an R package, but it is really built on top of a web server. So when you create an application, it is going to consists of a UI, which is the user interface, which is what you see in your browser and interact with. And there is some function running in the background, which is called the server. And if you change something, some input in the user interface, that is going to have an effect on the server to change maybe an output, which then gets sent to the user interface. And we see a plot appearing or changing. And in the meantime, the client, which is you and your browser, sends requests to the URL where you host this app, like shinyapps.io something. And the server is going to respond with this full web page, everything contained. But also as you click around or move a slider, uh, it is going to be in constant communication with the server, the backend. And uh, that's what makes it so. Um, reactive and interactive. There are lots of really nice resources and I don't know at this point, it is still under RStudio, but RStudio changed its name to POSIT. So I expect at some point these are going to migrate to a new domain, but I think some redirect is going to be in place. So you can still find shiny.rstudio.com where you can watch videos, really nice tutorials, and uh, the best part is there is a user showcase. So you can just go there and find uh, an interface or an application that looks close to what you were envisioning, or it's kind of a similar topic. And you can just 
get the source code and uh, use it as a kind of a bootstrap your own application, which is really nice. And if you go to articles, then you're going to see just how to get started, how to build your shiny app, how to improve it to make it maybe more performant, how to test it, and then how to share it with the world, which means deploying and uh, keeping it live, which is not going to be something that I'm going to talk about a lot, but I, I'll just touch on that at the very end if we have time to see what kind of options are out there. And of course, some recent books which give you a really nice introduction. First one is Mastering Shiny from Hadley Wickham, which goes through all the important concepts and uh, like how, how to use what's included in Shiny. If you are very serious about building your Shiny applications, then you can go to the next one, which is going to tell you how to engineer production grade Shiny apps so that you have lots of lots of testing. Then you might want to learn how to build a package. So it's a bit more involved, but if you want to avoid surprises in the future or uh, minimize that work for future you, then this book is a, a really good resource. And if you just want to utilize more what's out there in the JavaScript world, because at the end, Shine is really putting a JavaScript skin around R. So if you want to be able to modify the JavaScript part of the Shiny apps that usually when you get started, you don't even notice that it's there, then you can read the third book, which is going to tell you how to tweak your user interface further and how to offload some of the server-side computation to the front end so that it's not just doing everything. Go ahead. I thought someone wanted to say something. It's all right. So this is an example Shiny app in R from an R Studio little window. And the first thing we load Shiny, which is the R package and its name is in uh, lower case. And then we define the UI, which is, as you see, not a function, but it's just a, a list-like object that this fluid page uh, spits out. And there are lots of other options how you can define the UI. I'm just going to start with the simplest one. So fluid page means if you resize the, the window, it is going to reorganize the columns and the rows. And then within that, we have a main panel, which is at the center. And within that main panel, we might have a slider input. We can pull it left and right. And that is going to go from one to 5,000 with a preset value of 100. And now if you take that slider, you might change it to 10 or 2,000. Now the server is a function that has two arguments. One is the input, one is the output, and we'll talk about this a bit later. But everything that comes as a trigger from the UI, the user interface, is going to be part of the input. And then that input, as you can see here, uh, go back. So input observations, which is this value, observations is the uh, kind of the, the, the ID. And we use that ID to get its value. And we are going to then generate some random numbers, this many, 100 or 200, and save it into an object called dist. So this is now a bunch of random, random numbers. And we are going to create a histogram of these, uh, this vector give it some color, give it some label. And this is now going to be part of the output. So the output gets this, this plot element, which we'll see as part of the user interface because we have a placeholder for that plot output, this plot. So these IDs are really important so that there's a counterpart in the UI and the server side. So you can see here, input obs, is being used here. Output this plot is being used here. So there's a correspondence between the UI and the server. And once we defined all of these, then we can call shiny app 
tell it what the UI is, what the server is, and it is just going to uh, run shiny on a random port that you can open up in your browser. And then if you do that, this is what you're going to see. A slider and the plot of a histogram. This is not an interactive histogram, but this is just a, a basic uh, base R plot, like a PNG. And if you resize the screen, it is going to get regenerated and maybe shown in, in different dimensions. But that's pretty much that uh, reactivity you are going to get from this Hello Shiny app. But it's a value or, or anyone would start to learn these basic concepts about interactivity and how the UI and the server side of the app is talking to each other. So what I had here was a single file and you can have a shiny app in a single file, but sometimes these things get too big. And in that case, you can organize them like this. In a folder, you would have the UI in a separate file, the server function in a separate file, and you might have a global.r where you would maybe load shiny or uh, load different data sets or set some values which are going to be available uh, for the whole application. And you can also define a shiny app as a function, but I'm not going there yet. And if your app grows and grows and not even three files are going to be enough to contain, then maybe you can put functions in a separate file and source them or build an R package and load them, load that package at the very beginning. Or there's something called shiny modules where you can have multiple UI components uh, or multiple server components, and then you can store these things together, which is when, when you really have a big, big application. We are not going to have that today, and I'm not going to talk about modules. So let's see, what is it that we are going to use in terms of the data? So far, anyone has any questions? It takes silence to be no. So then let's talk about the data. So when you think about building an app, then there is this workflow, at least in, in my mind, there's a question we'd like to answer or to be able to answer it, we want to explore some options or a data set to get some kind of intuitive answer. So for this, often we plan a study, we collect some data, and then use that data to summarize it, maybe train a model. And this is what we are going to do here, train a model to help us answer that question. Once we have this model trained, which means uh, there are several factors which might uh, influence what our answer is going to be, then depending on those variables, we can make a decision. So sometimes we refer to this as a scoring engine, which just gives maybe probability of uh, being class A or class B or zero or one. And then once we have all this covered, which is all the boring science stuff, then we go and create some really nice visuals, maybe use ggplot or something on top of ggplot that makes it even more interactive, not just nice, or we put things in a map. And once we have these components that is going to help us tell the story, then we can put all these together in an application, which is where Shiny comes in, that kind of glues together the science part of it, the, the nice visual part of it, and everything like just how it's going to work. There's some other considerations, but this is kind of a general workflow that uh, these uh, app developments usually follow. And in our case, the very important question we are going to answer, if we have a picture of a banana, is this banana ripe or not? And the data set was collected by me and I was <laughs> uh, scoring the bananas if they are ripe or, or not. So this is my taste, uh, but it's still going to be useful. And how it went, I bought some bananas and I took a picture of every fruit over three weeks. And there were two groups. One was in a fridge 
the other couple of uh, individuals were left out in my basement. And they started to get brown, which means they are ripening from green to yellow and then spots and more brown. And at the end, it wasn't very tasteful. So next time I just buy more bananas and along the way I eat them and maybe score the taste as well. And uh, But that's what I ended up doing. And so I had, I think, how many? 11, 11 bananas, which is not a lot, but because I took pictures every day, it is still enough data points for us to, to have a look. So now these are the data points for for one of the group, which I think was the, the room temperature one in the basement. And you can see if you classify the pixels according to colors, then you have this spectrum of green, yellow, brown, and you can still now lump them together into green, which is this line here. You see as it ripens, the green goes down quickly and then it stays there. Then as it goes down, it gives way to yellow. And once the yellow starts dipping, then the brown increases. And this is when uh, you get that mushy thing, which might be good for a smoothie, but not really for direct consumption. And now it's time to go to our code. And I have this opened up in Visual Studio Code. Let me increase font size a bit. And this is the repository that you also have from, from the chat. So if you go there, uh, then you're going to see the code. You can download it as a zip file or a git clone it. And then you will be able to see what files we have in there. We have a folder with the app, which we are not going to touch until we go through some, some basics. Uh, but then we can go zero, zero, hello, shiny. This is what we have looked at, but now we can try to run it and see what the outputs are. Then we explore the data, then we do the modeling so that we have those uh, things that we want to deploy as part of the application. Abstraction is a step that I think is important, but we might not have too much time to cover every aspect of that. And then at the end, we'll have an application and then we'll see how the app comes together. Now, if you want to install everything that we need, then you can get this depths package, which is almost like our end, but a bit uh, less uh, exhaustive in terms of the packages that it's going to install, and then click depths install, which will pull in these packages. Uh, ggplot, couple of uh, regression packages, Plotly and Shiny itself, plus the data set for the bananas. I created an R package that uh, you can install. And once you install, then you will be able to load the data set that we are going to use to, to work tonight. So this is the Hello Shiny. Let's, let's start with this one. So I opened R and uh, now in the zero, zero, hello, shiny. Let's just see what were in the slides. If I load shiny and the UI. Now here's the printout what the UI looks like. And if you type UI and hit enter, then you're going to see this HTML code, which is what web pages are really just text files with some HTML and maybe other things sprinkled in. And the browser knows how to interpret this. And now you can look at fluid page, main panel, slider input, plot output, and what corresponds to them in HTML. So this abstraction of having the UI being defined in R is really just very helpful for our users who don't really want to do this in HTML. And I recall the talk uh, from our studio conference this summer when uh, Joe Cheng was uh, talking about how he was really against this uh, UI thing not being HTML, but really this was uh, 
a main driver for adoption because people had very little idea about HTML, CSS. And uh, if, if you don't have time to learn that, then it's really easy to get started with just a plain R code. So you, you see divs, which are these uh, nested elements in HTML for the container fluid. Then you have a column, uh, then an, an input container with the range slider, then some element for the plot, and then you close this. So this is really this nested structure in HTML. So this is all what I wanted to tell about this eventually. Shiny puts together a somewhat bigger HTML with a head portion and a couple of other pieces so that the browser will be able to communicate with the server. And, and that's what you are going to get as part of your response in the browser, which gets rendered as this really beautiful page. So the internet is really just interconnected server sending text files. So the server function, if you run that, uh, nothing really useful happens, but we can now click on this shiny app and it opens in the browser. So now you see this purple histogram and you can change sample size and the higher the sample size, the more normal looking this gets. If I go down to one, then it's just a single number, not too much to see. So this is our shiny app. And other ways of uh, running it. So this is interesting because shiny app, this function. Uh, yeah, I have to stop first. So this returns an object. A shiny app object. And when I hit enter for this line, really what happened is there's a print method for this shiny app object. And if I print this app object that's when the browser opens up so this is kind of one of the miracles in with shiny how everything is so intuitive and and just works oh and one thing i forgot to show here maybe it's still there if i click right click and view the page source then this is exactly the HTML that we saw, including container fluid and some of this body HTML and the head part is what is uh, going to be needed so that all the styling is there using this bootstrap CSS and all the JavaScript that Shiny needs is there. So these are files that you can find as part of the Shiny package and this is how things work. This is this is part of the magic. And and once you understand, it becomes not magic. So I'm not going to talk more about that, what's behind the wall. And you can also put this together in a single function and call that function. So if we put this run app UI and server into a function, then we can just use that and maybe put this in our package. Run app is going to run the same thing. So these are just different ways of achieving the same beautiful output. And that was Hello Shiny. So next we go and explore the banana data set. So if you now open up this one and you had uh, successfully installed the required packages using depths, then you can load this bananas package, which is going to have a bananas data set. And we we'll use a subset of the data set. Bananas looks like this. We have a couple of columns, fruit, which is the ID of which fruit I was taking a picture of, ripeness, according to me, is it under ripe, ripe, overripe, or very, very ripe? Then these four classes are turned into zero one if it's ripe or not, so that we have an easier way of maybe building the model around that. Treatment is fridge or, or room temperature. We are going to take a subset where treatment equals room. So not these top rows, but just the bottom half of the data set. Day means number of days since uh, 
the beginning of my study. So this is year zero for fruit 11. And these are just some aggregate measures of green, yellow, and brown pixels. Because what I did is uh, I masked around the bananas so that we can get rid of the uh, distractions and the shadows and everything like that. Uh, and then once, once I masked out, then it just became white versus non-white and the non-white pixels were counted and in the banana package there is a code for that using the magic uh, package how to do that and all the pictures are there so if you're interested in that you can check that out but at the end I just kind of lumped together the, the greenish colors the yellow colors and the brown colors because for our purposes that's going to be enough so let's take this subset and now the top shows that it's only a room. We can have a structure printed out so that we see what is character, what is factor, what is an integer, what is numeric value, and also have a summary so that we can see what are the min and max values for green, yellow, and brown. You can see that green is never going to be 100% because these were the kinds of bananas that I could buy at Superstore on that day. I was a bit disappointed that I couldn't find more uh, like greener bananas, but that's okay. Now, next is going to be just some plots. And uh, without going into the details, I just wanted to have like a base version and the ggplot version. And none of that is going to be what we use in the app. So when we plot these, I won't explain line by line because that would take too much time. I just like to show you these types of graphs. So whatever you can do in ggplot, you can do it in base, but in, with, with a lot more lines is basically what I'm trying to say. But it looks very similar to what eventually a ggplot with <laughs> three lines would look like. You have points showing you the scatter for, for the observations and some smooth lines uh, showing you the average trend across these. So now the ggplot version looks like this. Let me show a bit more. So the extra lines are just really defining the colors and, and maybe theming it a bit differently, but the data is going to be just the proportions of green, yellow, brown, and uh, mapping X, Y, putting there the points, the smooth, and then uh, a manual scale for the colors. Let's see how that looks. That's the one. Very similar, but a bit nicer and more intuitive in terms of how, how we code this. But it's telling us the same story as bananas ripen, they get yellower, and then they're just going to turn brown, which is something we already knew. Now the next plot is uh, showing us the distribution of the different color values for ripeness and different classes of ripeness. And why I wanted to look at this is because these proportions are going to define our model. So we can just say, when yellow is above, I don't know, 0.7, call it ripe. That could be one classifier, right? Or maybe you can build something where yellow is high, but green is low and brown is low. That's what we are going to call ripe. And this is what is going to happen with our modeling. Um, just in a bit more sophisticated way, because it can take a lot more dimensions and a lot more bins to find the best algorithm to, to get us that answer. Now, this is a ggplot version of the same histograms, but maybe organized a bit differently. You can see that this is, this is the part what we are really interested in, high yellow and low green and low brown. Now, I was thinking about the best way of putting everything together. And because we have three colors 
and so far we've seen only two axes really we need three axes and in the 3d it becomes a bit busy but there is something called ternary plots which i couldn't find a really good example in in a ggplot there's a package for that but i somehow couldn't make it work nice enough oh i have an error much better so this is the kind of plot that we can generate from three columns and i think this is pretty common in chemistry and uh, geology to have something like this where you show like phases of different materials and here we have green in this corner some banana would be totally green in this corner it's totally yellow in this corner it's totally brown so how they ripen they kind of go through a trajectory and if you hover above one value then you're going to see all the three components and then this is just uh, classified as ripe this is under ripe and then this uh light brown is very ripe and this is overripe which is almost like deep deep brown so this is how you can get this plot in plotly and some other nice features is is you can isolate these uh, so-called traces so you can remove them one by one let's just look at ripe or bring them back and just remove or, or keep ripe only and then you can also zoom in and then go back out so this is the kind of interactivity that you would get from a javascript based library which is nicely integrated with r there is a function ggplotly which turns a ggplot into a plotly graph so it's really almost feels like cheating but as i said i couldn't find a, a good enough uh, version for this ternary plot and that's why we have so much code helping us achieve the same thing but the basic idea is that uh, i put together a function which is just going to style uh, the axes as it says axis function and then i have a function which adds traces one by one which are just subsets of the data like the yellow dots the green dots the brown dots so that it's easier to color them so you can provide uh uh like what kind of color you want to assign to that and then the figure at the end comes together as plot underscore leave which is just a, a blank plotly canvas then we add these traces uh the four different classes and then define the layout which is just setting some margins so that the text is not going to uh, fall off and then some uh, settings for the ternary so that these numbers add up to one. That's the sum constraint. And then what we want to call the axes, green, yellow, brown. That's pretty much how the plotly graph comes together. And uh, for scatter plot or histogram, it is something very similar, but, but it's a bit more involved or a slightly different thinking than ggplot. So now we explored the data. We have some really nice visuals that kind of convey uh, what's in the data set. And now we can start looking into how we would uh, classify the bananas based on ripeness. And for this, we're going to use a library called E1071, which has some really nice uh, algorithm involved, uh, including the support vector machines which is going to be our best classifier tonight there's also mgcv which fits these generalized additive models with the uh, full splines and the usual things like ggplot plotly and our data package bananas mifa4 that is for a very specific aggregation purpose uh, you'll see so if i load these packages make sure that I have the right subset. Then I can do some further exploration about these classes. So this is just the ripeness class versus is it ripe or not? 
So one means all the ripe bananas, zero is everything else. So we can start maybe with a logistic regression where the zero one is going to be our response. And we want to see how yellow, brown, and green colors uh, impact the probability of being right. And for this, we need GLM from stats, uh, our package, and the binomial error distribution. M1 is now there, and we can look at the summary that tells us something important that we have these three colors, three values, but they add up to one. So one is really not needed because if you take subtract green and uh, brown, then you get yellow. So this is why you see NA because it's totally collinear. And in that case, you're just going to get an NA coefficient. It is not needed. We can drop it, but I just left it there because luckily R is taking care of it, whether we like it or not. So now what I'm doing next is uh, we can use the fitted values, which is the probabilities that you would predict based on the three colors and uh, cut that at 0 0.5 and see how that correlates with our uh, zeros and ones. And you can see that greater than 0 0.5. So whatever you see in this diagonal is the correctly classified cases and off diagonal, those are the ones that we misclassified. Or maybe I made a wrong call when I was <laughs> telling these bananas, is it ripe or not? And then if we calculate the sum across the diagonal versus the sum of all the numbers, then we get a measure of accuracy, which is a one way of uh, telling if this classification is good or not. We can do the same, but with some quadratics and without uh, spending too much time with regression or explanation. Let's just see if this improved things. So previously we had 0.916. Now with these quadratics, which means it is not just going to be a line, but uh, like a, a U-shaped curve. So we get coefficients for that. With this classification, we go up a bit. It's now almost 90.96 our accuracy this is the percentage of bananas that we correctly classified and then we can keep working on this ripeness thing m3 is going to be a gam model this is this uh, additive model let's see not much improvement it's it's exactly the same which uh, is probably due to the, just a small sample size So now these are our fitted values. Probability of being ripe is uh, really high for the ripe bananas, but there are some where you can see small probabilities or even the, the green or brown bananas sometimes get a high probability because of just how some banana looks different than others. And of course the ggplot version, which I'm going to skip for now, now we get into the prediction uh, area where we can uh, not just look at the data that we have collected and see what would we say, is it ripe or not? And we already know if it's ripe or not, but we can have a banana that we don't know if it's ripe or not. But we only know these numbers, the proportion of pixels. And based on that, we want to tell uh, what that might be. And in this case, it doesn't really make sense, but that's just the way how these models work. And in, in real life situations, this might be, are you going to qualify for uh, credit? Do you get a, a credit card or, or uh, yeah, what kinds of things, like what kind of music you like? These suggestion algorithms work somewhat like this, that they are going to put you in a bin and those are going to be the kinds of tweets or music that is going to pop up in, 
in your applications. So this is how prediction works. It is not perfect, but it does a job. So if we want to make a prediction, then we can take a model like M something, M3 is this GAM model, and then define a data frame, which is just a small version of the data set. Here, we want that to be totally yellow. So everything else is zero, yellow is one, that means no other color. And if we make a prediction for this, you can already guess what the result would be. And at the end, I'm just rounding it and make the printing nicer, but this is the important bit here, predict the model and the data frame with the same columns that you've used to build uh, that predictive uh, algorithm. Now our probability of ripeness is one. If I go totally green, then I get zero probability. If I go totally brown, I get zero. If I go somewhere in between, like some green, some yellow, mostly brown, now I wouldn't be able to tell what this would be, but it's still zero. So what happens if this goes up to 0.5 and this goes down to 0.4? It's still not six and three, no. So if I go 0.8 and this one would be 0.1, now this is a ripe banana. So that's kind of what we saw in the box plots. This is how for a zero one binomial data, this prediction works. And if we want to complicate things a bit, then we look at ripeness, which was the four classes. So we want to be able to not only tell, is it ripe or not, but if it's not ripe, which class it belongs to? Is it like a green or a brown version? So M4 is going to be support vector machine. I'm not going to tell a lot about this algorithm. This is a machine learning classifier, which works for all kinds of data set, including this multi-class problem where you have more than two classes. And what it's trying to do is that you have this multi-dimensional play uh, data set or, or space that you're trying to partition. And with three variables, it is almost too easy because we saw that in that plot, that this corner is kind of green, this is yellow. But when you have hundreds of variables, it becomes a lot more difficult and it's building a, a manifold which separates these classes in a multidimensional space. So SVM is our M4. Oops. So we want to keep the probabilities because as you'll see, that is going to be useful. Now this classifier, it becomes harder to tell if it's accurate or not because now instead of two classes, we have four. And now this becomes a somewhat more complex classification problem, but we can still go for something as easy as the diagonal versus off diagonal 0.98 for four classes, that's pretty good. Prediction works the same way. We have this predict function. What is the model name? And what is our data set that we want the prediction for? And this argument probability equals true is going to give us not just is it like which class it belongs to, but the membership probabilities. You can see highest for ripe, and that's why we got that prediction. For all other classes, it's, it's really low. For the totally green one, it's high probability that it's under ripe. That's why that's the call we make. And you can see it for the rest. And this is the kind of data we are going to use. And now we save M4 as our scoring engine. That's what we are going to use for the app to tell us if a banana is ripe or, or which class it belongs to. Or, so this is the probability that you get from the classifier. So high probability that it's overripe or the rest is low probability. So this is how the scores are going to change and tell us where the max is, that is going to be our classification. So I'm trying to speed up a bit because we haven't really built shiny yet. And this is the same function, but now we add in 
one more thing on top of what we saw before. Yes. And uh, now this is a plot. So once we have all the data points, then we can put here a dot or here a dot or somewhere a dot and tell if, if that composition of colors, what kind of class that would be. So we can make a prediction for this point that you can see here. So this is how we eventually we put together the app. And uh, this is actually the end of this second file. And I think uh, let's have a very quick break. So after this number two modeling, now we are going to quickly go through a file that I named abstraction. And this is the part where I'm going to talk about what this course was that I delivered a couple of months ago. That was for the Statistical Society of Canada and how to deliver applied statistics from inception to uh, deployment. And uh, a big chunk of the time went into, once you have this workflow, which is pretty much what we had before, this exploration part, what we had there and uh, the modeling. So these two, in my mind, give you a workflow. You explore the data, you get an idea of how you want to visualize, summarize that, and then what kind of analysis you might do to get an answer to your question, which in this case was, is the banana ripe or not? And so after you have this workflow, now you can start putting them together into these uh, modules, which in R are called functions. And this is what I mean by abstraction, that now once you have this mental model of what you want to do and how you might do it, then you can write these functions. And once you have written functions, then it's really just a step away from having your own package giving you a perfect score for banana ripeness. So we now only have three packages that we need because we decided E1071 is the package what we need for the four class algorithm. We again load these, take a subset and load in that model that we saved. So let me maybe close R and start with a fresh session. Load the packages, subset the data, load this object, which is now, we saved it at the end of this modeling uh, somewhere here. Save M4 into the app folder because the app is going to rely on it. So that's why I just saved it there. And we can load it. Now we have this M that is telling us, well, oh, it's a, support vector machine. Not very interesting output, but it is going to be our engine to, to score based on some inputs. Now the next function is going to be the prediction function. So what we supply to it is the model itself. We can have multiple models, so it's, it's a good idea to have that as an argument, and the values for green, yellow, and brown. So one thing happens here, which is going to, you, you see why this is important because the app, they have a range of zero to one, but if you chuck everything up to one, then they are going to add up to three. So what I decided to do, and other people might have uh, done differently, but it's just take the sum and normalize by that. So here you see, we get the inputs. We want to prevent to have some crazy stuff coming in. So we make sure that it's a numeric value. Then we add them up to get the total. So green plus yellow plus brown. If it's three or just one, it doesn't matter. And then we get the proportions by dividing with the total. So this is how we get our updated values, which are some normalized. We create the data frame with green, yellow, brown columns. This is just going to be as many values as, as you provide. If it's just a single value, it's one row. If it's five values, then it's five rows. And then we get predictions for those rows with the probabilities. 
So what we do here, we put together a data frame that this function is going to return, the green, yellow, and brown colors that we are predicting for the ripeness as a factor right, with the four classes. And then we are also going to append this attribute, what we saw, those are the probabilities. And the highest value is going to be this ripeness prediction. Uh, this might be a bit more advanced, this attribute stuff, but that is basically information that you just want to attach to an R object. That you can put it in an attribute, and some well-known attributes are like row names or column names or just names in a list. Those are stored as attributes attached to, to an object. So this is where the SVM prediction stores these numbers. That's That's how we get them. So if I source this function, then I can do something like this. And this is the pipe operator since R4.0, which takes this value and passes it to the function as the first argument. That's why we don't have it here because the pipe makes sure that that is happening. So what we can do, we pass this object, define some values and get this one row data frame as the output what our numbers were it's overripe and we get the probabilities in an extra uh, four other columns we can vectorize this so now we have two values for each color now we have two rows in our data frame and corresponding ripeness predictions so this is our uh, function which takes values and the model and this is what we are going to use to tell if it's like what kind of ripeness that is and what the probabilities are so that we can further visualize this. Then we have the rest of the function that we, we have used to create the Plotly uh, chart. And this is just to show how you might be able to annotate these functions so that you can tell future you or some other users what each argument is. So this is a title. It's kind of self-explanatory, but here, green, yellow, brown, you might not know. Green, yellow, brown, numeric relative color proportions. So now I remember, oh yes, that's what I measured in the pictures. So you can annotate your functions and then it is going to be really straightforward to uh, for other people to understand this. The trace function, I also introduced that before. So let me just source these. We talked a bit about these traces. So now I wrap everything plotly related into something called the base plot. We create a blank one, add the traces, define the layout. So if I want to now add the prediction point, this is the next function. So this is how these layers are coming together in the app, which you'll see. So this really just adds a point with a prediction. This adds a point just at whatever place without making a prediction. So the difference between add point and add prediction is this is just going to put a red dot on the plot. And this is going to put a dot colored according to the prediction, which might not be very visible because there are lots of points there. So that's why I decided to have a bright red dot as well. So just to see what's happening here, we have a prediction, this PR data frame. And now we can pass this, like we create a base plot, which would look something like this, just the base plot, same as what we had before, but now with a one liner instead of, I don't know how many, 20 some, rows we had before and if we want to add a point with a prediction as a separate trace then we can do it like this so now we have this prediction point and apart from having a, a red outline it is uh, colored according to the predicted uh, ripeness and the other function is just we add the uh, a point without making a prediction so that we can see what kind of values we input, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.7.
So this is all just functions that you create so that some of these logical steps in your workflow, like the prediction, showing that prediction on a graph together with all the rest of the data, that is going to be part of the application at the end. We can put all this together, plot the predictions. So we need that data frame, which contains the values, where to put the dot, what color that should be. And now this is just telling us the probabilities. So this is how, instead of showing it in a table maybe, which could be one option, we can create a bar chart to see if it's really hard to tell them apart or it's really clear cut that this is a brown banana. So now we have all the functions that we need and you can decide what to do with this kind of file. What I decided here, if you look into the app folder, you're going to see what we need for Shiny. Global, the server, the UI, and now we have this functions.r. So let me close everything else. So this functions file is the same as what we just reviewed, but I just moved it into the folder so that it's, it sits together with the rest. Now global, global dot, dot, sorry, global dot r is the file what Shiny is going to run first. This is where we load the packages. We take the data that we are going to display in the plot and source the functions. Sourcing the function is the same as copy pasting it into the terminal. Uh, so that goes like this. Can open. Oh, of course. So why this is happening is because these functions that are is relative to the root folder of the app. So when the app will run, Shine is going to treat the app directory as the root folder. So relative to that, function.r is going to load. But right now, I have to do something like this because my work directory is not the app folder, but just this repository. I hope this is clear so far. And what's very important to note about the, the global file is that is going to be run once, which means when you start the Shiny server, this global.r file is going to get sourced so that you have everything that you need loaded into memory. But the UI or the server function is not going to do anything outside of their scope. So whatever defined here is going to be constant, but it's also going to be accessible for all the sessions. And by sessions, what we mean for Shiny is that when multiple people log into the app or you open multiple tabs in your browser, those are going to become individual sessions, which will have access to everything in this global file but also they are going to have their own separate scopes inside of the server function, which means if I click around in one tab, it is not going to affect what I see in the other app, unless I do something really funny. But luckily that's very hard to do. So unless you assign something like this, A double assignment B inside the server function, this is unlikely to happen. So. I did not even show this to you. So don't, don't use this and then you won't have any issues. So the next thing is the UI. The user interface is going to start with a fluid page with a title. And then we have a row with some columns inside. So maybe what I should do is to run this app.
so that you see what I'm talking about. This is this is our application with a title, then some settings, which instead of a slider, I decided to go with this uh, numeric input. You can increase this probability. And as you do that, you see this dot moving around. So depending on what these values are, that's where that some normalization is going to happen. You can also type in something and then you see the dot moving to a place. Let's say it's a hundred percent yellow. Then we see the dot in this corner and the classification becomes like really, really high probability that it's right. And you can also interact with this graph the same way as before. So this is the app. Now we go back here. So in the fluid page, we had title, which defines what you see here in the browser tab. That's not the same as this title. That title comes from here. We have a column. And on top of that column, we have uh, an H1 that is just make this big first level heading telling you it's banana AI. Now this was one row on top. Now everything else becomes the next row underneath fluid row with columns. We have 12 units. So these should add up to 12. We have with equal to here with equal to six and with equal to four. So if you add them up, that's your 12. So this is just the proportions of how wide those columns are going to be. With the settings, we have just a very narrow column with the three numeric inputs, green, yellow, brown. Then the next column is going to have a placeholder for our plotly output, which is where the ternary plot is going to be. We define the width should be 100% of that column. The height should be 400 pixels. And then the third column is going to be that uh, scoring probability bar chart. So prediction, we're going to have a UI output that I'm going to talk about a bit later. So that's something which is again, just a placeholder. And then the plotly output with the bars. So let's see, this was column one column two and column three. And if you see here, it tells you something about the banana. It is a kind of a text representation of the prediction. The banana is ripe. If I go here, it says the banana is underripe. So this is where we are going to get the classification, not just you can deduce which is the highest and that's going to be the class but it is actually telling you so that's where this ui output is going to come in whenever we change something this output is going to change as well now another interesting thing what happens here when i start the app loading required package listening on this port so this is what we see here in the browser the local host on port 7917. So port is something in a web, web technology. On every computer, there are lots of ports. Those are like doors. You can go out of a door and you can come in a door. And when a door is shut, you can't really go through. And that's what firewalls do. And usually on a server, not every port is open, just very specific ports like the HTTP port. And if you want to use the HTTP port, then maybe this port is not going to be the best, but then you send that traffic to that port. So eventually you'll see the shiny app. But locally, you get this random port and you can open it up in your browser. So let's see what we have in the server function. And this is really the last file we are going to review today so that you understand how this app eventually came together. And this utilizes all that abstraction that we did before. Here as inputs to this function, we have the input, the output, and something called session, because per each session, you might have some 
uh, things you might want to do. This is not commonly used in simple applications, but in more complex applications, you're going to need the session object as well, which is a bit more complex than the input and the output, because you can think about input and output as lists. You put some values in, like in this case, if we go back to this uh, UI function, we have some inputs called green, yellow, and brown. So now it is almost like having a list with green equals one, yellow equals zero, brown equals zero. So if I, uh, Yes, I, I have to shut down Shiny. So if I store this as maybe input, then I can refer to these values as input. Input green. So this is how I get the value. What's different with this input object is when I say now this green value is 0.5, then whatever depends on this green value is going to change, like the plot itself. So when you change the input, either the green, the yellow, or the brown, then this plot is going to get redrawn. And that redrawn plot is going to be sent to the output as this ternary object using this render plotly function. So the render function here has its equivalent next to it. So maybe I should show them side by side. So this is the UI where you have the ternary output. So plotly output, this is where it gets rendered in the center. And this is where it's coming from. So there is plotly output placeholder and the render my plotly object. So once the input changes, you render the plot and now it is going to be reflected in the UI. Now the next important concept here with Shiny is something called reactive. Because as I showed you, when input green changes, how will everything else know that it has changed? This reactivity graph cannot exist in base R because there nothing is really connected. So if I say Z equals input green, then now it's 0.5. But if I change input green to 0.1, Z is still 0.5. So how to propagate these changes is where you need these reactive environments. And these are almost like functions. So at the end, you have this predict function, which we used before. It depends on green, yellow, and brown, but these are now reactive inputs. And the reactive input is going to give you a reactive output called pred. And you see, we are calling pred as a reactive object, almost like a function. So whenever things are changed as part of the input, the output of this pred reactive object is going to change, which is going to be reflected in the plot, which is going to trigger the bar plot to be redrawn and sent over to this plotly output. And then the last piece here is the ripeness. So this render UI corresponds to UI output. And this naming can be confusing. I often have to look up the help page because I mix them up, but maybe that's just me. So this UI output is going to depend on again this pred reactive and within that it's the ripeness that we want as a text that is going to be that factor level ripe or underripe which we then look at 
And if it's underripe, then we are going to print underripe and so on. So these are the four different options. And then we create this HTML element where we put together the sentence. The banana is dot, dot, dot. So when pred changes, then we get this state value uh, changed. And now the render UI is going to send it to the output, which will get rendered here as part of the HTML. So when is it when the pred reactive is changing? When we have some of the inputs changing. And what I use here, message, green equals the green value, yellow equals the yellow, brown equals the brown. Those are the messages that you see here. And we had an error, of course, that I'll have to check. But the basic usage is that uh, there are no errors and we get these values logged. So these logs or messages on the server side that the users won't be able to see are really good for just uh, making sure that things work as expected, or you might be able to read these errors. And even though on the front end, nothing really changed, but you'll be able to see, oh, in the logs, you see that render plotly had some issues on line 20. So now you can go back and see it's coming from here. So some, this pred, pred reactive was, was doing something that it wasn't supposed to do. So you might have to then check what was the previous value. Oh, we got an NA. How could that be an NA? Now that's what we need to find out. So this is how you would debug a, a shiny program, which is not very easy because you can just run it line by line. You have these reactive elements which make it a bit more complicated. But if you keep logs, then you are going to see that something went wrong with the yellow. And so you can try to reproduce and that way you would understand how the data input was wrong and how the prediction failed. So let's run this again. It is inside the app folder. So how we run is use the shiny run app function. And it can take a file name if it's a single file or if it's multiple files in a folder, then you can just give it the folder name, which can be the current directory. And in, in this case, a folder that sits in our directory and run app is going to open this up once more in the browser. And we can play with it and see how the outputs change. And as I recall, I also deployed this. onto shinyapps.io. So you can go ahead and try it for real. So that's the banana AI, now we have this beautiful app that is going to tell us if we know the pixel proportions. So for example, you would take a picture with your phone, then it would quickly run that calculation of the three different colors and your application on the phone would be able to tell you exactly what ripeness class it belongs to. That part is, is missing because it's a bit more complicated to, to add, but this is a, good enough version uh, for our Thanksgiving, our user group meetup. And uh, I'll stop right here and uh, open up for questions, but I have a couple of more slides. Like once you have this app on your computer, how does this get transferred over to like shinyapps.io? And that's pretty easy because in our studio, you have a button, so you just need to sign up for free, click that button and things are going to be deployed and they can go there and check it. So that's very uh, a good way of deploying Shiny apps, but there are some other ways. So if you have more complex apps, uh, then you might want to check those out.